but it led to being in a select group of New Zealand science communicators and advocates who were invited to take a flight with NASA's Airborne Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And what a buzz that must be. And coincidentally, our next speaker has also been invited on one of those NASA flights. In fact, for all I know, she may be the youngest person ever to go on a project mission with NASA. She's brought to us this afternoon by the newly formed National Women in Horticulture Initiative. And to talk to that, please welcome Bernadine Gill. Good afternoon to you all. It is a pleasure that I welcome you to the National Initiative of Women in Horticulture. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm from a family of vegetable growers just north of here in Pukekohe, and this time last year, I began my foray into industry governance by joining the Horticulture New Zealand Board. Since December, I've had the privilege of, of chairing the Women in Horticulture Executive Committee as we get this initiative off the ground. It's been busy and a lot of fun, thanks to the great group of people that I've been working with. I want to acknowledge these people and all those who have played a part in planting the seeds of this initiative for this national group. These were sown well before my time, growing from the regions, and it was concretised at last year's conference. So thank you to you all. I also think it's important to note that I, along with all of us, cannot help but view this topic through the lens of our own personal experiences and therefore we may have diverse views on the way it's approached. So with this in mind, I would like to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, let's make horticulture a great, inspiring and aspirational industry for both men and women to work. And as for our women, let's... Oops, sorry, there's you. Oops, sorry. Let's empower, value, and support them. But to do this, I think it's important that we set ourselves up by answering a few of the questions that we've had uh, since the group's inception in December. Question one. Why do women need a group, you say? There are many female leaders in our industry, all appointed on merit. Yep, I think we do all agree. But what kind of sense does this recruitment method have when our overarching society has inherited a gender-biased system of leadership? one of which that has little to do with meritocracy and more to do with sociobiology and social construction. There's a name for this system. Sorry. It's called the patriarchy. The Cambridge definition, University definition is presented here, but what I think we need to be reminded of is that patriarchy has not disappeared, it's merely changed form. See, so, yeah, I'm getting back down to basics. But how can we justify the merit-based principle when our founding fathers were simply considered so? Fathers. These gender roles were commonly accepted by both men and women as a status quo. We've obviously moved on from the system of leadership, you'll say, and yeah, we have. We all now have a lot more options than of playing a role in society, more opportunities than our grandmothers and perhaps even our mothers had. The eldest male is no longer necessarily the leader of the family. But this has happened because as a society, we've been constantly chipping away at this. Big steps and little steps. So I say, let's just keep on moving forward. Makes sense, I think. We all know the statistics around women in leadership. We've gone from 3% to 8% of women CEOs in the NZX50, but there are 15% of females on horticulture boards. And there are many more competent women to fill these roles, to fill more roles. But why aren't many more of them putting themselves forward? So I believe that this is why we need to be reminded that, independent of all of these women making it through, we have inherited this system, and despite the advancements, it is still there. So to me, this very perhaps unpolitically correctly questions, if women take public leadership roles which were originally destined for men, then who takes care of the kids at home? One could say that the dad at work, mum at home scenario is particularly apparent in farming families. Because when you look around rural New Zealand, many of the family units are managed this way, and by choice. But New Zealand statistics will tell us that this is seen across the board, urban, rural, everywhere. Of the 34,000 parents who took parental leave in 2016, 1% of them were fathers. 
a mere 446 fathers took their unpaid leave. Note, unpaid leave. How many couples can go without this income while the mother is also on leave? And what does, this society, what does this say about how our society views dads who stay at home? I think we can see a whole lot of bias right there. Enough said. So when people chuckle to me and they say, how about a men in horticulture group? I think, how about, is that, how about um, a support group for men who wish to take paternity leave? I think it's logical that when you have one gender moving into one inherited role, you do need the same on the other side. So perhaps horticultural businesses need to look at their parental leave policies. Wouldn't that be a game changer if we move faster than government at getting more of our wonderful men spending time at home with the young families? With the traditional image our industry has, we'd certainly have people talking. We'd make inroads in New Zealand society and we'd definitely make people notice horticulture as a good place for people to work. But getting back to the core subject, I say, come on, let's just get on with supporting as many women as we can working in our industry, full stop. Let's catch up to the other progressive nations and even out the leadership representation. The Women in Horticulture group are proud to share with you their one-page strategic play. Oops, geez, this way. I'll get it right. <laughs> um, that you can see up here and it will be made available to anyone who is interested. On your way out today, you can leave your card with us and we'll keep you informed of the activity as we move forward. And a special and sincere thank you to our founding supporters that you can see here. And for those of you who feel that perhaps support for this initiative isn't quite for them, you can always show your support by joining the UN movement of He For She. Hashtag He For She if you want to use it on your, on your Instagram pages. And continually chip away at advancing our society for the better. 5,000 New Zealand voices so far. But speaking of the UN, and without any further ado, I'm excited to introduce you all to our speaker, Alexia. One of the change makers of the new generation, she is the founder of Girl Boss, a community network supporting girls into STEM subjects. Coincidentally, she's just come back from New York after participating in the UN Commission of the Status of Women. Welcome, Alexia. Kia ora, Tlopalava and warm Pacific greetings. Good to be with you all this afternoon. And the first thing I'd like to ask of you all today is to all stand up. Can we do that? Can we all stand up? We've been sitting, we've been fully engaged, and that's good to see. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing a little bit of maybe some afternoon yoga. How does that sound? Okay, team, watch me. We're going to go down. And then we're going up, and we, it is a horticulture conference, so we're going to make a pineapple. This is a thousand-year-old yoga move, the pineapple. And then we're going to cut the pineapple in half. We're going to give one piece of pineapple to the person next to us, one piece of pineapple to the person on the other side, and back pineapple to ourselves. Okay, team, let's go. Down, up, cut, to you, to you, back to ourselves. Okay, we've got the drill. Now I want to see us do it a little bit faster, so I've got a challenge for you. When I say go, you're going to do that routine twice. Then you're going to high-five the person next to, them, uh, next to you, say thank you for coming, and then sit back down as fast as you possibly can. Are we ready, team? Get your spaces. Three, two, one, let's go. High-five, sit down. Thank you for coming today. Awesome. I love it, we're feeling fruity, we're feeling zen, and we are ready to get into it. So kia ora, talo falava, and warm Pacific greetings. My name is Alexia. A little bit about me, I'm part Greek, part Samoan. I'm 20 years old, and I'm the founder and CEO of Girl Boss New Zealand. I live in Oriwa, just north of Auckland, with my mum, my stepdad, my two cats, and my sister from another mister. And I'm really passionate about science, technology, engineering, and maths, which often get shortened down into STEM. And from a young age, I've always been very passionate about technology. In fact, just the other day, I was going through old files on my computer, and I found a slideshow CV I created when I was eight years old. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to present that to you guys today. So here it is, my slideshow CV at age eight. 
and I quite like it. It provides a bit of insight into me as a young person and what my hobbies and passions were. And as you can see in that red circle, my hobbies at eight years old were I love technology, uh, I love the computer, and I like making PowerPoints. Quite funny, I now speak to around 30,000 New Zealanders each year, and that involves making a lot of PowerPoints. So living the childhood dream. But from that young age, really passionate about technology, uh, I was always the kid who was spending my days in primary school, in the computer lab. It really it was really the place for me. It was sedentary. Most people would say that's a bad thing, but I was never good at PE, so it worked well for me. Well-paid, talent drought. So from the age of eight, I thought technology is the place for me. But what I found is, as I started to get older, that passion for technology made me feel isolated. In year 12, I was the only girl studying digital technology at my co-ed high school. And in year 13, I was the only girl studying advanced physics. And I'd go to coding competitions and science competitions and regularly be one of two, three young women in the room. You know, I wasn't to be deterred by the fact that I was the only uh, young woman in the room. And in year 12, I entered a coding competition put on by the local university. I prepped hard, studied hard. At the end of the two days of coding, I was delighted to be announced a winner. Now, this was pretty exciting. I was 16 and just won a full-ride scholarship to university to study computer science. I just won a university-level coding competition, a paid job at IBM, and all the technology equipment I could imagine. So as you can imagine, I'm feeling pretty cool. Right, I'm feeling pretty cool. And the next day, I rock into class, and my proud digital technology teacher announces the news to the boys in my class. Now, I'm expecting a bit of fanfare, to be honest. Perhaps a standing ovation as I walked into the room. Some slaps on the back. Perhaps my computer in the computer lab would be engraved in my honor. Alexia coded here. I mean, this was the sort of fanfare I was expecting but instead I got a completely different reaction. You only won because you're a girl. They probably just wanted you for the promotional ads. I thought that was quite the compliment, actually. Boys' brains are smaller than girls' brains. It's been scientifically proven, and that's why they're not in tech. Yes, really, all the way back in 2015. And I remember sitting there, and this has been a really defining moment for me, because up until then, my passion for technology had always been a little bit about me and how I was going to have this wonderful career in, uh, in science and technology. But when this happened, I started to wonder, are there other young women out there who are going through what I'm going through and struggling to stay true to themselves and their convictions? And they say injustice is a great place for resolve to take hold. And those experiences and the injustice of it spurred me to start Girl Boss New Zealand at just 16 years of age. It's been a pretty incredible journey since then. Now, three and a half years later, we're a network of over 11,000 young women. We're the largest women's network in New Zealand. Our programs are implemented in over 100 high schools in New Zealand, Australia, and the Cook Islands. I now work full-time at the organization. I've even hired my mum to work full-time at the organization. So it's been a really uh, incredible journey. And it's taken me to places I never could have imagined when I was sitting in high school just two years ago. Places like Buckingham Palace, where I got to meet this woman here, the Queen, where I received the Queen's Young Leaders Medal for Services to the Commonwealth. I received this at 19, so I'm the youngest person in history to receive this medal, which was pretty exciting. And I was really thinking today about how can I best add value to this audience? An audience that's so intelligent and so good looking. And I thought, how can I add value? And through conversations uh, with the Horticulture New Zealand team, I identified that a key problem uh, that a lot of uh, people in the space were having was how do we engage Generation Z? So Generation Z are the new generation of consumers, of employees, perhaps even competitors, and they're aged uh, 10 to 22, and they make up one quarter of the New Zealand population, and that's uh, expected to grow. So, 
I thought, we're going to look at the traits of Generation Z. We're going to hack the Gen Z mindset. And because Generation Z have a very short attention span, we're going to make it a game. And a game similar in style to a game you may have heard of before, Tinder. Who's heard of Tinder before? Hands up. Who's heard of Tinder? Okay, hands up nice and high, nice and high. Who's heard of Tinder? Who's on Tinder? Never seen hands drop so fast. Thought I recognized you in the back. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with Tinder, the premise is pretty simple. Swipe right equals yeah, swipe left equals nah, and a bit of a hot tip for you, swipe right is even used in Gen Z slang. So the next time uh, perhaps your children or your grandchildren, they ask you, how was your burger? Just reply, swipe right. And they'll think you're pretty cool. Okay, so I want to hear from you. I'm going to uh, show some traits, and you're going to yell out, swipe right, swipe left. Let's do this. First one, Generation Z, passive or activist? What do we think? Yell out. want to hear from all of you. Swipe right. Good job. Awesome. They say that, that millennials had the Kardashians. For Generation Z, their heroes are activists. Just look at some of the most defining moments of Generation Z's lives. Generation Z will be responsible for the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, climate change, terrorism, mass shootings. These have given Generation Z the inspiration to change the world and the grit to make it happen. Just look at who is the most powerful voices in Generation Z. I present to you Greta Thunberg. Greta is just 15 years old, but is the face of environmental activism in the world today. Gone is the days where leadership was about power. Leadership today is about influence. Just ask Greta's 1.5 million young people she inspired to strike for climate change around the world. She chose to not go to school in order to protest climate change for one day a week, and this sparked an absolute global movement. She inspired Sophie, an 18-year-old from New Zealand's Kapiti Coast, to organize a school strike for climate, the largest student protest in New Zealand history. We saw tens of thousands of New Zealanders swap pens for placards and took to the streets to protest climate change. Whilst young people have always rebelled, never have we had the technology to mobilize this quickly and at this scale. And this is defining for our generation. Even I, when I met the Queen, I didn't waste a moment to get my little activist piece in there. Now, it's pretty nerve-wracking. What do you say when you meet the Queen? Right? What do you say? And I'm a bit nervous, and it's never a good thing when I'm nervous because just anything comes out. And so they read out your name, Alexia, from New Zealand. You march down the aisle, and you meet the Queen. Now, I'm a bit nervous. So the first thing I say when I uh, meet the Queen is I do my curtsy, and I say, did you know... There's more CEOs named John than CEOs who are women on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. Now, the Queen, she's just dumbfounded for a second, and then she bursts out laughing. And then I say, but don't worry, the young women of New Zealand that I work with are going to change this. And the Queen replied, very good. So I like to tell the young people in my workshops so that the Queen believes in you, And it's really interesting, how do we uh, as organizations market to this generation that is so activistly um, focused and so um, got that real activist mindset? Now, I just take a look at our own organization. So when I first started Girl Boss at age 16, I came up with this pretty, f I thought it was a pretty cool slogan, connect, inspire, empower, and equip young women to lead and change the world. My mum thought it was cool too. However, I realized that it wasn't tapping in to Generation Z mindset. It was long, it was convoluted, and pretty forgettable. So, we've now just changed our slogan to only 4% of NZX CEOs are women. We're changing that. So we're seeing that more and more organizations are now switching to a mission-focused 
uh, statement, in their slogans and the way they conduct themselves. Generation Z want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to be inspired and they want to feel like they're part of a movement. And it's really interesting, how do you as an organization uh, and is in marketing to consumers, and Generation Z consumers and employees, how do you bring that activist mindset to the forefront? Uh, here's a quote from one of our uh, recent attendees to uh, our Girl Boss programs. Generation Z, like all of us, want to be part of something bigger than themselves, and they want to be part of that movement. Okay, realistic or idealistic, what do we think? I want to hear from all of you. Swipe right, swipe left. Oh, swipe right. What, what did you think, sir? Swipe right. Anyone think swipe left? Any brave souls? A couple of brave souls? I feel like they're increasing now. So the answer is plot twist. The answer is swipe left. Generation Z are highly realistic. And that is one of the key differences between Generation Z and Millennials. Generation Z have lost trust in traditional forms of operation and education. They know that a university degree provides no guarantees. If they want to get their business education, they could choose to be like Eli, a nine-year-old from Auckland who lives across the street from me, and he gets his business education by starting his very own podcast, interviewing different business leaders. His quote there really sums up Gen Z mindset. I'm big about money, I like to create ideas, I like to be in charge, and I like to help other people. Now, I'd like nothing better than to follow in my mother's footsteps and spend my years at university studying philosophy and spending an awful, a long, uh, awfully a lot, amount, long amount of time at Shadows Bar, the University of Auckland Bar. But frankly, I'm too bloody scared. I've seen the consequences of my, our parents' 10-year-long OEs and extended adulthood. Have you seen Auckland house prices? This is no time to be naive. And this is all the, uh, seeing this has made Generation Z very fearful about their future and, in fact, really craving stability and security. Generation Z are so scared they've stopped smoking, stopped drinking, and even stopped having sex. Young people these days have truly gone mild, or as my mum likes to call us, we're the fun police. So how do we market to a, uh, for, to a generation who would rather Netflix and chill than go to a party? We see a huge rise in what marketers like to call the Netflix effect. Gone are the days where there was only Channel 1 and Channel 2. Generation Z can now flick on their TVs and uh, go on their laptops and start, repeat, binge watch, any show they like, on demand, when and where they want it. And they're even wanting this uh, personalization for their food. They want fast, fresh food, on demand, convenient, and ready to go. Even at Girl Boss, we have to constantly challenge ourselves how to provide that personalized experience. When we talk to our members, no longer do they want to come to huge conferences even. Now they're starting to say, we want it to be personalized. It's not enough for you to come and speak to our school. I want to know how I can actually be a leader. So we're trying to question ourselves in our organization. So we've just uh, launched Girl Boss Connect, a personalized mentoring program that provides a wraparound support for young women, a five day long program. Okay, competitive or collaborative? What do we think, Generation Z? Oh, I love it. Swipe right, swipe left. The answer is swipe left. Generation Z are highly competitive. Just look at the media they consume. MasterChef, New Zealand's Got Talent. Not even our love lives are free from competition. 
uh, Generation Z believed that only the best can win. Millennials believed everyone can win. If we look at their values, millennials wanted open workspaces and collaborative environments. What do Generation Z want? Leadership development. Spend or save? What do we think? Generation Z, what are their views on finances? Let me hear from you. Ooh, it's quite, we're pretty mixed on this one. Ooh, okay, what do we think? What do we think? I feel like you're losing trust in me too. You're like, oh, okay. So the answer is swipe right. <laughs> For Gen Z, money talks. One of the most defining moments to them was growing up in the 2008 global financial crisis. Gone, they're not holding millennial views of purpose over everything. In fact, if we look at their career values, and I see this reflected with the tens of thousands of young women that I work with, financial security is more important to them than doing something they love. Generation Z are highly entrepreneurial. 58% want to start their own business. 76% want to lead others. That sounds like a bit of a problem to... <laughs> At number one factor in choosing a job today, good salary. How do we market to these potential employees where they're so money focused? A lot of interesting conversations to be had. Uh, now, I'm really lucky when I reflect on my own journey. I was raised by a single mum uh, in Mount Roscoe in Auckland, and now I run an organisation, and it's taken me to places I never could have imagined just two years ago and in high school. Places like 10 Downing Street, where I got to have tea with Theresa May. That was pretty exciting. Uh, also got just spoke at the United Nations headquarters in New York at the U UN Commission on the Status of Women, which is the largest UN forum in the world today. Youngest New Zealander to speak at the UN, which is pretty exciting. Got to have a one-on-one -on -one with this guy, Jamie Oliver. I thought you food enthusiasts would appreciate that one. So Jamie Oliver is one of the most inspiring people I've ever met, most charismatic person I've ever met, uh, and he also likes to mentor young activists when they come to London. And so I was lucky he mentored me when I come to London. And he shared a bit about his own story, and, it was, and he said that when he started his very first restaurant at age 25, he decided to only hire people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people who were homeless, people who had just left prison, or people with drug and alcohol problems. That was his criteria at who could work for his very first restaurant. Now, when he made that decision, his own father didn't speak to him for a year as he thought Jamie was throwing away his life to help others. But Jamie's decision to do something different and give a hand up to others propelled Jamie into global fame. Once people heard about the mission of the restaurant, they were waiting months in advance to get a booking. And he was sharing that journey to me, and he said something to me which has stuck with me ever since. He said, never be afraid to be the most hopeful person in the room. Never be afraid to be the one with the most vision, the one with the most optimism. In times of change, the ones that will hold the most power are the ones that have the most optimism. If you walk into any boardroom, into any meeting, the person who has the most vision, the person who has the most power, uh, is also the person with the most optimism. So really, um, it was really stuck with me. And I think particularly in New Zealand, where we've got such a tall poppy culture, I constantly have to challenge myself, how do I uh, stay hopeful? I also got to meet this guy, David Beckham. Now, woman in the audience, this might be a good time to pause and reflect. <laughs> Love it. So, uh, David Beckham, ex-captain of the UK football team, pretty big celebrity. So, I met David Beckham when I was at Buckingham Palace at the networking function after I received my medal. And I've got a bit of a funny story about when I met David Beckham. So, we're at this networking function. It was pretty formal. And I look over, and there's David Beckham, standing sad and lonely by the juice table. Now, here's the thing. You may be David Beckham, but a Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are in the room. Well, you might as well be a pot plant, honey, because nobody's looking at you. So everyone's over here all looking at Prince Harry and Meghan, 
And I look over, there's David Beckham standing sad and lonely. I think, well, I better do my good deed of the day and go cheer up David Beckham. So I bounce over, and me and David, it's going really well. We're talking about girl boss, we're talking about London, we're talking about New Zealand. It's going really well. We're chatting away. And then a royal staffer comes up to us, somebody who works at Buckingham Palace. And the royal staffer turns to us and says, Excuse me, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Prince Harry and Meghan request your presence. David goes, oh mine. The royal staffer goes, oh no, sorry, Miss Alexius. <laughs> now as I'm being escorted away from David Beckham, like, bye David, to have my one-on-one -on -one with Prince Harry and Meghan, I'm thinking to myself, my life will never top this level of cool. <laughs> Now, I've just finished a regional tour of uh, New Zealand. So uh, just in the past month, spoke at over 33 schools, everywhere you can imagine, speaking to thousands of young people. Uh, and one of the key messages of my speech was really around the importance of making unusual choices. When I chose to start my organization at just 16, my mum said to me, why don't you go to university first, and then you can just donate to charity. When I told my university, uh, my careers counselor that I wanted to forego $83,000 in university scholarships so I could work full time at Girlboss, he said to me, why don't you go to university first and then you can work at Girlboss? But I chose to ignore all that sensible advice. Spurred by the belief that if you want average opportunities, make average choices. The reality is, if you want opportunities that not many people get, you need to make choices that not many people make. Choices to be the most ambitious person in the room. Choices to do something that other people are too scared to do. And what I tell the young woman in my workshop is, how do you be unapologetically ambitious in the pursuit of your most uh, audacious goals? How do you be the most ambitious person in the room? How do you be the most hopeful? And that brings me to my Edinburgh presentation. Thank you. Now, we do have time for questions, I believe. We do indeed, yes. Alexia. Thank you so much. But I am suddenly very conscious of the fact that I left school in 1973. In case maths is not your strong point, this was when dinosaurs roamed the earth. I also remember those days when there was only TV1 and TV2 because I was on TV1 when there was only <laughs> TV1 or TV2. So thank you for reminding me of that. That's great. <laughs> we do have time for questions. Let's go to the app. Uh, okay, that's, well, the first one just says British football team. I think it was English football team. And then oh, yes. Uh, hi, Alexia. You said the Gen Z are realistic, but then you say 56% want to own their own business, or 76%, I think, want to be leaders. Is that idealistic? Yeah, that's a really good point. So we're seeing Generation Z are very ambitious. I do think they're realistic in terms of the fact that they're willing to make the hard choice. So we're seeing even uh, in, in these studies that are just coming out now around how Gen Z are performing in the workforce because they are, have only been in the workforce for quite a short amount of time. But we're seeing that they're willing to, uh, they're willing to work longer hours. So I think that's realistic. I think we're seeing that they're less likely to be interested in things like gap years less likely to be interested in travel, more likely to be already saving for retirement. So I think in that way, very realistic. Uh, in terms of being, uh, the views around entrepreneurship, I think it, but reason, you know, in terms of being leaders, uh, such a large portion of young people want to be leaders, I think that it's going to shift in terms of the fact that there's going to be a growing gig economy. So they're going to be more entrepreneurial. So we're seeing 14% of Generation Z already have a side hustle. So they've already got a small business in, in a way in which they're earning money. And in that way, they kind of are a leader uh, in, in that side hustle. So I don't think it's unrealistic to expect that there will be uh, more Gen Z leaders. But the terms of what leadership will look like is going to drastically change. Question from uh, Joe John, Alexia. Great presentation. Uh, what is the source of the data in your Tinder poll questions and answers? Yeah, definitely. So uh, a range of different um, organizations, I think it was in the 
probably in like size eight fonts, you couldn't have seen it, but at the bottom of the presentation for each slide. But um, in terms of key resources, I would recommend if you want to do further research on Generation Z, uh, there's a great report from uh, a consulting agency called XYZ University that they've released uh, one of the leading point, uh, leading um, data on Generation Z. Uh, also seen uh, World Economic Forum have done research as well on Generation Z and their views. So those would be my two starting points uh, for learning more about Generation Z. Let also have, engaging oh, with Generation Z is another good way to get their insight. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. That's all good. Let me ask you a generational question then. Uh, the Bachelor, girl meets boy, boy meets 23 girls, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what is the attraction for Generation Z of that program? Oh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Generation Z actually are watching less TV in general. So I think they're actually watching more Netflix. So I think a lot of, like, The Bachelor, people don't even um, use TVs in their houses. So I think it's more um, turning towards Netflix anyway. Um, but always, also, the drama and the gossip, right? And the backstabbing, what can be more exciting than that? <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, <laughs> you're quite right about the use of television, though. I mean, my own family, uh, the idea of spending a night in front of the television just doesn't exist. Mm. They're constantly online. And they're um, uh, late 20s, early 30s now. But they would not sit down and watch a night on television. Uh, do you work on five-year plans? Me myself? Yeah, you. Um, so Generation Z are very into future planning as a whole. That's what the research shows. For me, I have less faith in future planning because when I was... But I was, I was very much, as a young person, someone that liked to plan five, ten years in advance, already, you know, was saving for a time and at a very young age. Uh, but now, as my journey's ch changed so much because of starting Girl Boss New Zealand, I started in high school. I thought it was just going to be a small school project. Now... Um, I work full-time on the organisation, so I have less faith myself personally on, in five-year plans. Right, any further questions, ladies and gentlemen? We do have some microphones there if you want to go old school. Yeah, come on, bring it. Nothing on the app? All right, Alexia, well, we might Thank leave you. it there. Uh, we do have the capacity to create change every day of our lives, so happy creating. Alexia, you're an inspirational figure. It's been a pleasure listening to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexia Hilberti-Doo. Thank you. Beautiful. And it's attractive.